to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Acts chapter 5, verse number 29. We welcome you to our study of the book of Acts. What is it that Peter said this about when he said, We must obey God rather than man? We hope you get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to study Acts chapter 5 through 8 together today. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In Acts chapter 5, we start off with a very uh, eventful scene where Ananias and Sapphira try to lie to God. A very powerful lesson is taught here. They have a certain amount of land and they sell that land and they decide together that they're going to keep part back and lie to God. And Peter will even say to them, while it was yours, you could have done what you want with it. But one of them goes in, did you sell it for such an amount? Yes, I sold it for this amount. Drops dead on the spot. And Ananias and Sapphira both do the same thing and they die right there before lying to God or while lying to God. From what lesson do we learn from that principle? I can't lie to God. I can't fool Him. I, I can't say, well, I, I'm the only one who knows this and we're the only one who know this and God doesn't know. God knows and sees all things. Now, that's a two-edged sword. That's wonderful. When we're living right and doing right and trying hard, when we're facing struggles and difficulties, hey, it's wonderful to know. God knows and sees and God cares for each one of us. First Peter 5, 7, He can help us. He can encourage us. We, we pray. We find encouragement through His Word. And so if I'm living and doing right, it's a wonderful thing to know that God knows and cares. If I'm not, that's a pretty scary thing. If I'm trying to live in immoral life, I'm trying to hide things, if I'm trying to sweep it under the rug, if I'm trying to act like it doesn't exist. You know, I know people who sometimes they'll be doing something and they think, I've got everybody fooled. I can look at this image. I can look at these photos. I can do these things and nobody will know. Nobody's watching. Nobody's going to see. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. Proverbs 15, 3. All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, the secret things will be made light on the day of judgment. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14. And so we want to learn a very practical lesson from Ananias and Sapphira, and it's this. Don't even think that we can fool God. God knows all and God sees all, and that can encourage us again if we're living as we ought to live. Now the verse that we opened with. 
Acts chapter 5. What's the context of Peter saying? We ought to obey God rather than man. It takes us back to the third chapter in the book of Acts where a man is lying lame and Peter and John don't have any money to give him, but they raise this man up to walk and to leap by the power of God. The Jews want to know by what power or by what authority have you done these things? They respond by saying, Jesus, nor is there any other salvation, any other name. He's the only way, the truth, and the life. And so this message of Christ and these miracles is growing. And so they now say to Peter and John, no more preaching about Jesus. We're going to, we're going to put you in prison. We're, you're going to face dire consequences. If we hear another word come out of your mouth about Jesus, you're in big trouble, in essence. What did Peter and John say? That may be the case, but we must obey God rather than man. Are there times where the government may do things that are contrary to the Scripture? Sure there are. Think about the things that are happening even now. Think about things like abortion. God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. Our government says abortion is legal. What does God say? It's murder. Who am I going to obey? You've got the government that says it's okay, and God who says it's not okay. We've got to obey God rather than man. What about things, moral things like gambling or alcohol or drugs? Even in some places, marijuana is being legalized. Legalized. You've got, you got gambling, you've got alcohol, you've got drugs. The government may say at times, and well, that's okay. God says it's not. Who are we going to obey? God. When it comes to things that are really pressing on us today, things like homosexuality, the Supreme Court has now said, that homosexual marriages are legal in all states in the United States. Our government says it's okay. God says it's not okay. Leviticus 18.22, Leviticus 20 verse 13, Romans 1 verse 26 through 29. What are we going to do? Government says it's okay. God says it's not okay. Listen to Peter's words again. We ought to obey God rather than man. Friend, does the Christian want to try to live his life in harmony with the civil law? You bet he does. Romans 13 teaches as long as you know we can, we're going to follow the law, live by the law, be good, honest, upright, uh, trustworthy citizens. But the moment that law violates or is in conflict with the Word of God, God's law always takes precedence. As we think about Acts chapter 5, Peter says and clearly says to these leaders, you do what you got to do, we're going to keep preaching the gospel in essence. And there were consequences to that. They kept preaching the gospel. Acts chapter 5 teaches they were willing to take those consequences. Listen to the words. The example here of the apostles' evangelism in the face of persecution ought to greatly inspire every follower of Christ to evangelize. Listen to Acts 5 verse 40. And they agreed with him, that's Gamaliel, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, what did they do? So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted word that has suffered shame for His name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. What a, what a powerful, inspiring message. They beat them. Stripes were laid on their back. They said, no more preaching about Jesus. They left that assembly, went straight to the temple, and started preaching Jesus. Why? Because ultimately, God's the final judge. Don't fear what men can do to us. We want to fear God. He's the one we ought to fear. And so God and the gospel are more powerful than what any government may dictate contrary to His Word. And friend, another reason they did that is this. Listen carefully. People were dying every day then, just as they are now, without the gospel. A few stripes on their back now wouldn't amount to much to them if they could save a soul from eternal death. If they could save a soul from eternal torment, that'd be worth it. And friend, it emphasizes the power and the need of the gospel 
and our desire to preach to the lost so that we can be saved. And so let's do everything possible to spread the gospel as far and as wide as we possibly can. Go with the, all the world. Mark 16, 15. Every nation. Matthew 28, 18. Every man. Colossians 1, verse 24. And we're going to proclaim the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, verse number 9. And so what a powerful, powerful lesson this is about the apostles and their evangelism. We then turn to Acts chapter 6, and we have a, a kind of a debate that goes on between Stephen and some in the synagogue of the freedmen, some who are there who believe in the Old Testament who are trying to stick to those ways. And, and as Stephen preaches the power of the gospel, we find one of the great statements. You know, the book of Acts is a book of conversions. Acts 6, 7 is a bunch of powerful conversions. Listen to this. The Bible says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Now watch this. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now what do you think about that? Here are these priests who have been serving on the Old Testament, who are familiar with the law, who have daily been making those bloody animal sacrifices, and knowing the law, being familiar with sacrifice, maybe even looking for the Messiah. They hear the gospel preached. A great number of disciples are added, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Friend, these priests were recognized and knew by the people and they obeyed the gospel? Why did they do that? Because it's the power of God's Word. Because it's the truth. They were looking for and ready to leave that old system. Friend, as you think about these priests obeying the gospel, under the Old Testament, we've got to realize this principle. They had to come to the conclusion, just as the Old Testament Scriptures taught, that that system couldn't save. The Bible clearly teaches that the blood of bulls and goats cannot save. Hebrews 10 verses 3 and 4, they cannot save us. The Bible teaches that the Old Testament system was vanishing away, was growing obsolete. Hebrews 8 verses 12 and 13. And Jesus nailed that old law to the cross. Ephesians 2 14 and Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15. And so these priests saw the light. They saw the truth. They knew Jesus and the gospel were the way and they were willing to leave that Old Testament system which pointed us toward Christ. Matthew 5 verses 16 through 18 and Galatians chapter 3 verse number 24. And so as Acts chapter 6 continues, we learn about Stephen. And we're going to learn about what Stephen does and how he begins to preach the gospel. And really, Stephen, as we think about it, is one of the first people to give up his life for the Lord and His church. Listen to Acts chapter 6, verse 8. We need a whole lot more people like Stephen. The Bible says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. You know, he was a man of great faith. He's a man who put his trust and power in the Word of God and, and God worked through him and there was no denying what he did. He even had that realization himself that he was a servant of God. But friend, as we said, we need people in the church like Stephen, men of faith, men who trust in the power of God, men who are willing to proclaim it even in the face of adversity. The gospel, it has to be preached. We need that faith in it. Romans 10 verse 17, that it is the Word of God. And we need to stand up and say what God has said on these issues. Now, as Acts chapter 6 and 7 continue, Stephen speaks with the men here and he proclaims Jesus. And that message is now going to continue in Acts chapter 7. And really, Stephen's sermon is basically a, a history of the Old Testament plan, scheme of redemption that led right up to Jesus. And there are four main characters in his sermon. He preaches about Abraham, how Abraham received the promised blessing and that through his seed, all nations would be blessed. He talks about, about Joseph and how God was with Joseph, how He took care of him, how He brought Joseph and his family and they were taken care of in Egypt and how the seed continued through Joseph and his family. He then brings it up, the great man deliverer Moses and how Moses took God's people out of Egyptian bondage, how they headed toward the promised land and how God worked with Moses brings it all the way through these patriarchs 
right up to Jesus. Jesus, He's the fulfillment of all these plans and prophecies. All the promises to Abraham, and your seed all nations will be blessed. The promises made to, to Joseph, the promises that were delivered to the people during the time of Moses. All of those culminate in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every promise, every prophecy pointing us towards salvation leads us right to Jesus. He is the fulfillment of those things and God wants us to follow His teaching and to ultimately follow His way. Now, how did the people respond to that sermon? Showing them the error of their way, pointing out Jesus as the Son of God. We realize that they had it all wrong. They thought God was going to dwell in these physical temple, this physical temple they had made, and that, that that was somehow going to be restored and brought back. And Peter or Stephen clearly teaches God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Look at Acts chapter 7, verses 48 and 50. Notice what the scripture says here. The Bible says, however, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? They think that God's in the temple, and the temple is that sanctuary, and that's the place where God's going to dwell. And, and Stephen clearly says, it's not something made with hands. That's not where God dwells. They put so much trust in that physical temple that it was their downfall. Jeremiah 7 verse 4, as they are facing great adversity, as the people are about to go into Babylonian captivity, what do they say as a hope? The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Save us, O our temple. That's where they put their trust and hope instead of in God. And friend, let's not make that same mistake as well. You know, a, a practical application is to realize this. They thought God dwelt in the temple. They thought, you know, going to the temple was where we'd go to meet God. And they had this whole idea wrong. And I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we can confuse the building that we meet in with a holy place where God is. Now, don't get me wrong. When Christians assemble, wherever it is, God's in their midst and in their presence. But the building is not holy. The building is not something where God dwells today. In fact, do we realize that the church is not the building? 1 Corinthians 12, verses 25 through 27, Paul says to Christians, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. You know, I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can say to ourselves, I went to church on Sunday morning. I got my ticket punched. I'm okay till the next Sunday. We've got to live every day for Christ. Luke 9, 23. Jesus said we've got to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow Him. And so, like the Jews, let's not confuse where God dwells and the power of God and that, that, that God can work through His people if we're willing to follow Him. Now, friend, Stephen, as a gospel preacher, stands out. And here's one of the reasons why. He was a man who was not afraid to speak plainly, to speak bluntly, and to cut right to the heart of the matter. Notice these words in verses 51 through 53. The Bible says, Stephen speaking, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you have now become the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. Now you talk about strong preaching. You talk about preaching that would make you sit up and listen. Peter said you're stiff-necked, you're hard-hearted, you're un that word uncircumcised had to get their attention. That was something they really despised. You're uncircumcised and hard in ears. You won't listen. You're rebellious. And here's what you and your people have done. My friend, he wasn't doing that to be unkind. But he did do it because it was true. His preaching was blunt. It was to the point. It was forceful. And it was meant to shake them to their core. To help them see 
their rebellious way and to turn to Jesus. Now, friend, as we think about practical lessons, let's, let's realize that sometimes preaching, that the preaching sometimes has to take a, a different tone. Depending on the need and the audience, it may very well be that way. Jesus did that. Mark 12, verse 24, Jesus said to the Sadducees, You do therefore greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And other times we, we preach in, in love. And so you've got to be careful. We want to be careful, but realize we need not get mad at the messenger if the message hits us the wrong way or if the message causes us to be pricked in our hearts. Paul would say it this way, in Galatians 4, verse 16, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Let's now turn our attention to one of the marvelous, there's two marvelous accounts of, occursion, of conversion that are going to occur in Acts chapter 8. The first is that of Simon the sorcerer. In Acts chapter 8, Peter goes to that area where Simon is and he begins to preach the gospel. He preaches Jesus. He preaches the plan of salvation and the scheme of redemption. And, and Simon, who has been a sorcerer, a trickster in his former life, he hears that message and he responds to it. He obeys the gospel and Simon is baptized. And Simon's conversion and his sin that follows that is a great example recorded in the New Testament to prove that a Christian can sin and be lost, but doesn't have to. We often refer to this as God's second law of pardon, and by that we mean in Acts chapter 2, when one initially obeys the gospel, sins are forgiven. What happens then after I become a Christian and I sin? Simon shows us what happens. Look in Acts chapter 8, and I want you to notice these words. Let's look beginning in verse number 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered him money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Listen, to this, don't miss this now. Your money perish with you. Because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray to God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you're poisoned by bitterness, bound by iniquity. And Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the things which you've spoken may come upon me. Now, what do we learn from this example? Two powerful things. Number one, a Christian can so sin as to be lost. There is a false doctrine that says, once you're saved, you're always saved. Often known of as the perseverance of the saints, the idea that you can never be lost. I want you to listen carefully. Simon obeyed the gospel. He was baptized by an inspired apostle. He became a Christian and he sinned. Now let's ask the question, did that sin, after he became a Christian, jeopardize his soul? Listen to Peter's words again. Your money perish, don't miss this, with you. Simon, at that point spiritually, would have perished. That means he would have been lost. Your money perish with you. Friend, there isn't a clear, clearer example in the Bible than this. If I were going to show that once saved, always saved were not true, here's what I need to do. I need to find a Christian who sinned and who the Bible said was in a lost state. That's Simon. He's a Christian. He sinned. And the Bible says, your money perish with you. And so the idea of once saved, always saved, although some seek comfort out of it, some think it brings security, really is not true according to the Scripture. Now, a second powerful lesson is taught as this. I can so sin as to be lost but I don't have to. I, I've sinned and you've sinned. We've all made mistakes and done things that are not right after becoming a Christian. I don't have to be lost. How wonderful is that? Peter looks at Simon and says, Simon says, uh, you know, here's what Peter says to him, you're lost, your money perish with you. Repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart may be forgiven you. And Simon says, pray for me. What can a Christian do if he does sin? Repent and pray. He changes his heart. 
changes his way of thinking, changes his way of acting, and he prays to God, and God will forgive him. And so, how encouraging is that? Now, we want to mention the last example of conversion in Acts chapter 8, and it is the Ethiopian eunuch. Here, Philip is teaching the old Ethiopian eunuch. He's up in the chariot with him. They're riding down the road. Uh, he begins to teach in Isaiah 53 about Jesus. From that point, he preaches Christ. The man hears the message. He gets that message. And in Acts chapter 8, we learn that that man is ready to obey the gospel. For the scripture says in Acts 8, verse 26 following, you know, he sees water. Hey, here's water. What hinders me? And Philip says, if, here's the condition, if you believe with all your heart, you may. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They stop the chariot. They both get down out of the chariot. They both go down into the water. He baptizes him. They come up out of the water. And he went on his way rejoicing. What did the Ethiopian eunuch do to be saved? He heard about Jesus. He believed in Jesus. No doubt he's willing to change his ways. He confesses and acknowledges Jesus as Savior. And he's baptized. And he goes on his way rejoicing. Friend, in every account, we've been driving this point home, in every account, the plan of salvation is, is clear. You've got to hear the message. And so we want to ask you today, that, that compelling, that most important question ever, have you obeyed the gospel like they did in the New Testament? Have you heard the message about Christ? Do you believe that message with all your heart? If you believe with all your heart, Philip said you may. Have you repented? of things in your life that are not right. We're not saying we're going to be perfect, but are you going to make up your mind to change and follow that out in your life? Are you willing to confess Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life? Acts 8, verse 37. And would you do what they did on Pentecost? Would you do what Saul of Tarsus did? Would you do what the, Phil the Ethiopian eunuch did? Would you be baptized for the remission of your sins? Here's how Peter said it. Baptism doth now also Save us. 1 Peter 3.21 Jesus said it so plainly in Mark 16.16 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, we're begging you today. If you've not obeyed the gospel plan of salvation like they obeyed in the New Testament, if you've not become a New Testament Christian, submitted your will to the will of God, we're urging you today Please obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less is our plea to you today. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.